Caves of Genius We know more about the first European settlers, the Cro-Magnon, than we do about the first Asians and Australians, but this is more to do with the history of archaeology and European self-satisfaction than with anything else. Predictions are dangerous when it comes to early history, but it seems safe to say that the big new discoveries are likely to come in China and other parts of East Asia. Meanwhile, the Europeans enjoy the odd bits of poetry awarded to early cultures by the accident of where their bones were found. They are Aurignacians, Magdalenians, or Gravettians, which is confusing, though better than the preferred modern academic term European Early Modern Humans, or EEMHs. So, who were they? Most people living then would have known only small local groups. It has been estimated that throughout this long period, there was rarely a gathering of humans on the planet numbering more than 300 or so. There must have been breeding across different groups, or the genetic cost would have been horrendous, so there must also have been contact between tribes at the edge of their range. We are sure they had language, but what kind? Settled people in Celtic or Chinese cultures had different dialects in different valleys, altering every few score miles. The same is true in Papua New Guinea, Australia, pre-European North America, and the Amazon Basin. The languages that emerged in different parts of the world are very different from each other, though hints of some original or er uh languages can be traced through common-sounding words. But over larger distances, there are big differences in the way sounds are formed, where in the mouth and throat, how the lips and tongue are used, and the way grammar works. It seems likely that the Cro-Magnon people like Aboriginal Australians, had a kaleidoscope of local dialects and languages with enough familiar words and sounds to allow communication across the edges of rival tribal groups. We also know that later agricultural societies worshipped deities associated with their survival, gods for water, rain, sun, corn. So it seems likely that hunter-gatherer societies gave a special place to the aspects of nature they relied on most heavily, the animals they killed and used. Today's hunter-gatherers tend to show reverence for and close observatory interest in the birds and animals they live off. African hunters are known to mimic animals they intend to pursue to try to get inside their thinking. Surely the cave paintings of Auroch and Bison have a similar origin. Modern hunter-gatherers also have creation myths, stories about where they came from. It seems unlikely that the darker-skinned, earlier versions of ourselves did not have those too. And indeed, the three hundred or so painted cave sites in Spain and France discovered so far imply a belief system based on animals and the natural world. Looking, drawing, copying. Using the hand, eye, and memory seem to constitute a very early human characteristic. And it is always possible that the cave paintings are art for art's sake, rather than having a spiritual purpose. Yet the use of cave art by people in Africa and Australia, and the intensely repeated images, suggest some kind of religious system. We have very early bone flutes, and the paintings would have been made in the semi-darkness. There must have been stories, too. It is not a fantastic leap to imagine music-driven underground rituals intended to ensure that the deer and horses keep migrating, or to honour the giant creatures brought down by spear-throwing hunters. The association of darkness, bulls, and mystery is deeply embedded in the European imagination. Similar art may have been made elsewhere and lost. It may yet emerge in many other places. Six-thousand-year-old paintings were found recently in a cave in Inner Mongolia, northern China. But what we have in southwestern Europe is a wonderful trumpet blast for the arrival of fully modern humans, art already quite as accomplished and moving as the later drawings of a Rubens or a Van Gogh. Our relationship with a closer contemporary relative, the beetle-browed humans we call Neanderthal, 
is a darker story. These people can be defined as a separate species or a subgroup of our own, and were physically distinct, heavier boned, with differently shaped skulls, and perhaps without full speech. They appear fully developed only around 130,000 years ago, and survived in Europe until between 30,000 and 24,000 years ago, though they disappeared earlier in Asia. So, as an unsuccessful species, an all-round failure much mocked by cartoonists, they survived, roughly speaking, for a hundred thousand years, much longer than has Homo sapiens outside Africa so far, and indeed fifty times longer than the period that separates you, reading this, and Christ. What happened to them? There was no cataclysmic event— Modern humans lived alongside their near relatives for around 30,000 years. Scattered archaeological evidence suggests Neanderthals may have copied the new super-hunters, altering their own tools. Biologists fiercely disagree about whether the two groups interbred, and the latest thinking is that probably they did, a little. There is a little DNA evidence from some scattered communities. The new people clearly enjoyed advantages. The Neanderthals may have used a form of humming or singing communication rather than full-scale language. It has been suggested that because they lived in small groups, they did not need to convey complex information, but only emotion. So far as we know, though they buried their dead and may even have used makeup, they made no art and did not invent bows, harpoons, needles, or jewellery. They survived well in climatic conditions that we can barely comprehend. The Old Stone Age was a time of ice sheets arriving and retreating, testing the flexibility of humans to the utmost. Neanderthals had to rely on the skins of the animals they killed to protect them from the cold, but modern humans had a secret weapon, more important even than their better cutting edges— their spear-throwers, or the bows that would allow them to kill from a distance. They had sewing. Many beautifully formed needles have been found, as well as the awls to cut the holes needed for the thread to pass through. As with today's Inuit people, Cro-Magnon man could dress in clothes that fitted closely, and were worn in layers, giving much greater protection and flexibility than bear hides. Brian Fagan says... The needle allowed women to tailor garments from the fur and skin of different animals, such as wolves, reindeer, and arctic foxes, taking full advantage of each hide or pelt's unique abilities to reduce the dangers of frostbite and hypothermia in environments of rapidly changing extremes. The needle, plus the better weaponry and the group planning allowed by full language, made Cro-Magnon unbeatable. The Neanderthals may simply have been driven to extinction by competition. Or worse, there is unsettling evidence from Le Roy in France of butchery marks on a Neanderthal skull, suggesting that modern humans may have eaten the contents. The Neanderthals were probably cannibals, at least some of the time, but it is possible that any interaction we had with them back then was far removed from mere social observation, still less regular interbreeding. Neanderthals, hmm, far too tasty to flirt with. Of course, we have only the bony, stony splinters of lives lived in wood and colour and enriched by music, stories and ideas about the cosmos lost to us. But such vast stretches of time have left their marks on us. Some anthropologists believe that our preferred normal size of family and friendship groups— the people we really know and interact with, not our Facebook friends, reflects the size of prehistoric hunting groups. Then there was even more need for a division of labour. The skinning, curing, cutting, stitching and cooking had to happen alongside the hunting and foraging. Sexual division of labour was already a fact. It has been argued that such seemingly subtle differences between the sexes today, as men's greater enthusiasm for strongly tasting food and drink, curries, pickles, whiskey, are dim reflections of the hunter-gatherer past, 
when men foraged further and had constantly to test the edibility of dead flesh and berries. The way our brains process visual information, ruthlessly focusing on movement, is certainly an early hunting and running away adaptation. Is our readiness to close the curtains and huddle in front of a television set when winter arrives a memory of the safety felt in underground caves? Knowing for sure so little about our early society can make us dryly cautious when we try to imagine this lost, vast stretch of human history. Probably the more boldly we let our imaginations range, the more realistic we are being. But what lessons can safely be drawn from prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies? First, that we were, from early on, the pawns of climate. Human civilization emerged during a warm, wet phase of Earth's oscillation. Our earlier close-squeak moments came as a result of global cooling, and there is no reason to suppose the cycles of warming and cooling have been forever suspended. We may be heating the planet up dangerously fast again, and we may disappear as a result, but our history reminds us that we are versatile. We are here because we are good adapters. Second, we are both extraordinarily creative and extraordinarily violent. Indeed, the two seem worryingly inseparable. A range of modern historians and archaeologists have effectively debunked the myth of the noble savage, which infected European thinkers, reacting against their own leaders' war-making, from the Enlightenment of the 1700s to communism and into our own times. There is a history of lethal raiding and occasional massacres that has been uncovered from Stone Age Europe to the New Guinea Highlands, from Alaska and the Americas to the Asian steppe, which clearly predates war-making states. As we shall see, it was certainly not universal, but hand-axe-shaped holes in the skulls of murdered Europeans suggest prehistoric man was doing more than making art. The archaeologists Stephen Leblanc and Catherine Register, after contemplating the evidence of war and massacre among the Anasazi people of New Mexico long before Europeans arrived, have made a long study of prehistoric warfare, which they conclude was regular and very brutal. They say this about those famous glorious caves. Even more evidence of warfare is found among the paintings at Lascaux and other caves in France and Spain. These earliest known human artworks feature magnificent renditions of bison, mammoth, and deer, but also include stick-like human figures, with spears projecting into their bodies. Somehow, descriptions of these less-than-harmonious sides of the world's wonders don't often make it into the travel brochures. There is a failure to look for or see evidence of warfare because of a myth and the preoccupation with the idea that the past was peaceful. As I have argued earlier, this was probably linked with our strong group bonding, which allowed us to populate the world in the first place, to celebrate us, and, by extension, to demonize them. We probably wiped out other human types. We certainly wiped out other mammals. And throughout our history, we have, in the intervals between making art and love, tried very hard to wipe out each other. We began, and we remain, agents of instability. 